Okay, cool. I'm just going to start this. So, I don't need a microphone, do I? Do you work? No. That's here. Okay, guys, I'm just going to start this. So, um, hi guys, my name is Patrick McCorry, London, and today what I'm going to present about is more an introduction to cryptocurrency. So obviously I've been doing research in this field for five years, Bitcoin, I could have come here and presented my research, but I realized is that when you go through the talks, everyone's going to talk about what I talk about anyway. What I noticed when I was looking at the Twitter feed, I guess, talk, so 44% of the people here are new to Ethereum and cryptocurrency. So it would be really nice if one, give everyone a fresh understanding of how this works, and two, if you already know how cryptocurrencies work, maybe I can remove some misconceptions. So raise your hand if you're deep in this field. Okay, cool. You guys are new then. Sort of not, not at all. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, they saw me there. Okay, good. So, what I want to highlight first is, when back in 2013, when I started looking at Bitcoin, there was $20 in this room at the time. So, who was in this space by 2013? Who was doing work for Ether in 2013? What did you guys think? Did you think it was a weird internet money or a weird crypto money? You thought it was a scam. There you go, a scam. Everyone thought it was a scam. Dark money for the Silk Road. When I started my PhD, they're like, Patty, if you, uh, you know, if you look at Bitcoin, you're wasting your time. I'm not going to get a VC to give you money. But I didn't care, to be honest. You know? I just wanted to be Bitcoin for fun. So when I got into it, I realized, actually, it's better, and that there's so many cool things about Bitcoin. I'm going to look at it from several different perspectives here. To begin with, why is, you know, cryptocurrencies interesting, but data structure is not? Okay? So let's consider this really naive example. We have Bob. Bob's a baby. And Bob has a database. Thomas comes along and he says, Bob, I want to audit your database. I want to verify that everything's correct. How can Alice do that? How, she, how can Bob actually prove that his database is actually correct? That all the records are what they say they are. Okay, what he could do is he could give Alice the entire database. Grants access and Alice can start looking at the records. That doesn't prove the database is correct. So it just gives Alice access to the information. So what we could do is, is there a data structure or a protocol that would allow Alice to recompute the entire database herself? Then she can confirm that Bob's database is actually correct. Da, 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 blockchain. You know, this is actually why the blockchain itself is useful. The blockchain is just a cryptographic audit log. It doesn't do anything else. That's why people are really excited about this in the synchronization space. Okay? So if, that, if Bob is updating his database, as a naive example, he'll update it every 10 minutes. When he does that, he'll create a new block. He creates a new block. And this now can act as a cryptographic dotted log. This is exactly how Bob can put his database over here. What Bob can do is just send over his blockchain to Alice. Bob can send over spam. Alice can recompute the entire database herself using this, you know, uh, blockchain. Then she can create one, the final block, and now she's recreated the exact same database that Bob has. Now she can just compare the two databases and confirm, yep, that's exactly what Bob's database looks like. So now I understand exactly why his database is in that state. Now the big issue comes is that how do we know that Alice is looking at the blockchain. And Bob just didn't make it up on the spot. Or maybe Bob just computed this random blockchain and gave it to Alice just so Alice would be confident that, you know, that the database is okay. So this is where distributed systems or global consensus protocol come in. So how can we convince everyone in the world that this is the one true blockchain? The question is, what is a consensus protocol? Basically, there's a set of computers that want to reach agreement about a single decision or a data item. Okay? So 
gigamas and five tick computers in some warehouse. And now the classical problem, did Alice pay Bob five coins or did Alice pay Caroline five coins? They run this through some consensus protocol and they should come up with the decision that Alice paid Bob five coins. Fairly straightforward. But traditionally, classic, uh, consensus protocols have a trade-off between safe and reliable. This is sort of the fight to get a consensus protocol. What does that mean? Safety tends to mean everyone should agree to a decision and then never forget about it or change our mind. Once we've decided Bob is our Alice has paid Bob, we should never change our mind about that decision. Liveness could mean, or pretty much mean, how many peers have to be online and honest before we can consider the decision final. Okay? That everyone has reached agreement on the decision. So why is it interesting for the blockchain protocol? If we consider classical consensus protocols, for about 30 or 40 years, this is what they look like. They're small scale. They only tend to focus on a fixed set of nodes, five, six, seven computers. And they tend to only handle one third policy. What I mean by that is that 30, only 30% 30 of computers or 33% of computers can be lawless before we break the consensus protocol. This is because they focus on safety and fork avoidance. We should always reach a decision. Once we've made that decision, we should never change our mind. And finally, there's no financial incentive. These classical consensus protocols, we set up the computers, they just do it because they've been told to. There's no reason why they're participating. This is why Bitcoin and Ethereum and Nakamoto consensus is super interesting. Because it, it basically flipped the table and changed how we consider how we consider designing consensus protocols. What do I mean by this? One, Nakamoto consensus works on a global scale. We're all using Bitcoin and Ethereum today. There's a mechanism to update our database so we all agree about the current state of the network. What it can also handle is 99% fault. What do I mean by that? This is because Nakamoto consensus focuses on liveness and fork tolerance. As long as there's one miner making blocks, we will always reach a decision. We will always get liveness. The blocks will keep getting minted and we'll keep you know, running the consensus protocol. And this works because we no longer focus on safety. So we can make a decision, we can forget about the decision, make a completely different decision within a short period of time. That's really cool. We can actually tolerate forks and tolerate decisions being forgotten about, but remade within a short period of time. What's really cool is that there's actually a financial incentive to run the consensus protocol and participate. So out of you guys, who's tried to mine Bitcoin or Ethereum before? There you go, there you go. Did you guys ever try to run BTFT? No, so there's no financial incentive. So we're here, you guys are making money for mining Bitcoin and Ethereum and by participating in the consensus protocol. So that's really cool from a distributed system. And what are they reaching agreement on? Obviously, the whole point of Nakamoto consensus is that they'll eventually agree upon a single blockchain. So if anyone in the world can download the blockchain, they can re-execute every transaction, and now they can recompute the same database as everyone else in the world. So there's a replication network. You replicate all the data, and everyone can reach agreement. Now, because of the way Nakamoto consensus is compared to the design, we, it runs in this new security paradigm called trust but verify. Now, we still have to trust miners. We still have to trust the people involved in Nakamoto consensus. We trust them to include transactions in the blockchain. But they have a financial incentive to do that because they get money. We trust miners to always extend the longest chain. But we don't have, we trust them to do that, but they have a financial incentive to do that anyway, because they make money from it. Other than that, we don't have to trust the miners at all. So we can validate every new block they create. If they create a block that's invalid, we just reject it. The whole point of Nakamoto consensus is that we can hold the miners accountable. If they act out of order or they try to cheat, we can just ignore them and only trust or only follow the honest miners. So that's really cool. Now, once we have this global ledger, or this public bulletin board, what can we build with that? 
So assuming everybody in the world can see the same bulletin board, what are the two applications? Obviously the first one is this, peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. So it's a solution to the double spend problem. This was me in 2013, I got really excited about Bitcoin. But I remember when I first spoke to the Ethereum developers back in 2014, they told me about Ethereum and I got super excited by Ethereum. Took this a little bit further. Instead of just financial transactions, why don't we deploy programs on this global network? And then why don't we execute the, the programs on the global network? What's really cool now is that conceptually, there's a single program out of reach of any human interference. And everybody can see it, everybody can interact with it. We don't have to trust anyone to run, the, to run that program. So given these global censorship resistant programs, what can we build with that? Now, I'm interested in cryptographic protocols. For 30 to 40 years, there's lots of research papers about building really cool cryptographic protocols. There's auctions without auctioneers, e-voting without any Italian authority. You can even do massive poker on the blockchain in a fun way. But none of these protocols have ever been built because they all assumed there was either a public bulletin board or an authenticated broadcast channel. And this is exactly what Ethereum gives us. Ethereum was one of the first platforms that would actually allow us to build and run cryptographic protocols. And of course, we can also you know, run CryptoKitty. If you want a Tamagotchi, you can run a Tamagotchi with Ethereum. Do you guys have CryptoKitty? Then, okay, we've got one CryptoKitty. You know, we, can breed, you know, we can breed, we can auction them. That's what we want to do right now. Okay, so that's the whole point. We can now build these cool cryptographic protocols thanks to the blockchain and CryptoKitty. Now, I must say, my research is in security engineering. I like to try to design secure protocols, and I like to build them. So why are cryptocurrencies interesting from a security perspective? They're the largest bunk bounties in the world. They're 40 lines of code, code sorry, and they hold millions of dollars of assets. Classic example is the DAO. I'm pretty sure most people here know what the DAO was. You know, back in 2015, there was 40 lines of code. It was basically like a Kickstarter program where people could deposit money. Once it has enough funding, anyone in the world could submit a proposal. If it gets enough votes, that proposal got you know, funded. Of course, historically it got hacked. The DAO hacker found a bug. They started draining $50 million from a bank vault. And historically that was reversed. But the whole point here is that there was some random person in the world who stole $50 million because they exploited a single bug. And actually at the same time, the Ethereum Foundation were also during the contract. You know, the black hat hacker was stealing the money. The Ethereum devs discovered it. They tried to steal the money. You know, it was really fun actually. So that's the point. You know, you contract one bug, you lose $50 million. Now as developers, you're probably not going to work on the smart contracts that I can build. You're gonna be building the exchanges, the web wallets, the hardware wallets. This is all still a fun place for security. You know, we're not a good group. 33% of Bitcoin exchanges are being hacked by someone else. And when they get hacked, it tends to be large scale. Right, Gox lost 850,000 Bitcoin. Silk Road lost 170,000 Bitcoin. Bitfinex lost 120,000 Bitcoin in 2016. This is the interesting thing, isn't it? 2016, this week, they should never have lost this, but that's another story. But this is really cool as well. If you're building on the wider ecosystem, you have a responsibility to have an adversarial mindset. Uh, uh, mindset, sorry. If you're not careful, someone could hack in, steal your private key, and steal all of your money. So you've got a responsibility to have you know, a more responsible mindset. So who thinks this all sounds interesting? Raise your hand if you think this is interesting. Everyone, okay, everyone, that's fine. So how does this all tie together? So I've condensed groups it a little bit because I think most people here have a rough idea what's going on. But as everyone's aware, you know, we have a pri private public, we have a private public key pair, which is your private key is what you can give to your computer, and your public key is your identity. So I can compute this on my computer and give anyone here my Ethereum account and you can send me money. Now in all these cryptocurrencies, the transaction format looks roughly like this. There's a sender and a payee. 
How's this going to help? Amen. There's a risk keeper. That could be one of your deacons. Uh, here in Macau, we have our contacts. There's some volume of things that are going on. Maybe I'm self employed. Look at the transaction for me. Because we're going to reward the miners for including our deacons. But now there's a payload. You get a coin, the payload allows you to go and use the coin to buy some data. And Ethereum is sort of the bytecode is for your smart contract when you deploy it or when you want to call a function. At a high level, this is what the transaction is going to do. So once you've got a transaction, how do you get it across the network and into the blockchain? I've got my 1999 application, so my team signs it, broadcasts it, and now this gets sent to a peer on the network. What this peer will do is, it will get his local copy of the database that represents the currency of the network, it will get the transaction, and it basically just checks does the sender have enough coins to pay for this transaction? And if they do, they keep a copy of it and they pass it on to their peer. And every peer will do the exact same thing. It gets across the network, and eventually every single peer in the network has heard about your transaction. Now, why are we doing this here? What is the point of sending an unconfirmed transaction across the entire peer network? One of the reach the peers who are running the consensus system, the miners, who are solving that proof of work to create blocks and they update every once in a while. Okay? And what is a block? Conceptually, a block is just an ordered list of transactions. When I receive a block, I process the transaction in exact order of order. And that's important as a smart contract developer. And if you have a function that depends on the order of transactions, going to enable first come first serve. We'll talk about it later. But basically, at a concept conceptual level, a block is just an ordered list of transactions. The miner doesn't really care what they do, as long as they pay for it. And the block just performs a batch update on the network. Okay? So basically, the block is sent to every computer on the network, and they'll update their database <coughs> according to that block. And the question is, where do blocks come from? They come from these financial regression assets that we call miners. And they're all in competition to create the block chain. Whoever creates the block gets rewarded for doing it for doing that in the future. Okay, now I'm going to get you guys to be miners. You're all miners and you're all in competition. And you're all going to try to solve a puzzle. Let me check my time, by the way. Okay, I have 10 minutes. Awesome. Okay, so you're all miners and you're all going to compete to win some money. So who's watched Countdown before? The old English TV, you know Countdown, yes. Okay, there's no generation gap. Maybe it's only a person. What? what? No, how do you not know Countdown? No, out, oh, uh, Countdown. Oh, is it? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what you guys are going to do is, you're going to be a big number on the screen, and six smaller numbers. Using any combination of addition, subtraction, <laughs> multiplication, or division, I want you guys to recreate the big number. If the first person to solve it, you know, raise your hand, yell out the answer, whatever you guys want to do. Go. Yep. Yep. Any other answers? No, any any combination. Any other answers or So what's really cool here is that we have multiple solutions to the puzzle. Now, not every solution is going to be right. This is where the difficulty or the quality of the solution comes in. The less numbers you can require or the less operations you require, the better the solution. So maybe you only accept puzzle solutions that will only use two operators or no numbers. Obviously, my solution is real, but it's not good enough for the proof of work. Another property is that this puzzle took time to solve, although this is really quick. It took you guys a bit longer to solve this. But once you've solved the puzzle, anybody can verify the solution. That's sort of the property we want. Because now we can make sure it takes 10 minutes to create a block. But when I get the block, it's quick for me to verify the puzzle solution is real. It's also 
probabilistic. There could be more than one puzzle solution. Here we had about four solutions. Now you're all competing to win the, the prize of £55,000 or £12.5 million. There's only one solution, the not minor gets the full reward. There's multiple solutions, you're now all in competition for the prize. What's really cool? So they send the puzzle out to the network, every peer gets the block, they check it's valid, they check the proof of work, yep, it's good enough, and they get a reward. They update their database, and every peer does exactly the same thing. And now we've effectively performed a botch update on the network, we've updated everyone's database, and now this miner will be rewarded with advances. Now, one key point is that every single computer has a list of deterministic rules called consensus rules. And every block must conform to these rules. If you create a block that, for example, creates 182 billion coins out of thin air, then that will be considered an involved block. Although that actually happened in Bitcoin. That wasn't a consensus rule. So putting the pieces together, users create, send, and publish transactions to the coins. Transactions propagate across a peer to peer network. Miners compete to create blocks that are considered a proof of work. Only the blocks that end up in the wrong group and are found to be true will perform the botch up. I haven't really alluded to that yet, but that's pretty much it. Now, if you like this introduction, introductory lecture, what I do in London is that I run a cryptocurrency class for the end of the year. Now, I, was, I initially built this course for 20 students. What I decided to do was to book a lecture theater in the evening and just see who would show up. And our biggest class had 350 people. So that was really exciting. They're all new to the space and they're learning about the space. So we cover these topics, really update the website. We cover blockchain as a data structure, which is comp based versus use blockchain model, peer to peer network, how do we break smart contracts, why these networks can be broke, I mean, why can this work? We then talk about you know the nature of money and off-chain payments work. How does the lightning network work? How does Cardano's work? And next week we're going to do financial markets. So Bitcoin and Ethereum are the most traceable chains in the world. What can we do to make that a little bit better? So that's it, Ruben. I have a question for you. I don't know about time for questions. Yeah. Okay, I can take one question. If you oh, and there's videos as well. So I, I, I record all my lectures. started this course for two reasons. So I was designing the course and um, we wanted to do this for years on our own. And literally two weeks before I had to start, I decided to run the course. I never planned to run the course. In fact, the university taught me nothing about the course. I just gave it away to my friends and family. Yeah, so it's only me. The other students. I'll leave you all to it. Thanks for listening.